The Center is proud to host today's speaker, who is one of the nation's leading constitutional law scholars and who has been an extraordinary advocate for civil rights during this decade of the War on Terror. I had the pleasure of getting to know Professor David Cole last year while visiting at Georgetown Law School, Georgetown University Law Center, excuse me, and broached the idea of his visiting here. I'm thrilled that he accepted our proposal. To save time, I'm not going to go through his immense scholarly achievements, <coughs> such as six books, and his impressive record of litigation, including Supreme Court cases, such as Texas versus Johnson on flag burning and Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project on the First Amendment and national security post 9-11. I do want to say, however, that I believe Pulitzer Prize winning former New York Times columnist Anthony Lewis was entirely right when he described Professor Cole as one of the country's great legal voices for civil liberties today. Without further ado, let me introduce Professor David Cole. Thank you. Um, hopefully we turn, turn the mic on. Um, thank you, Mark, uh, and, and thank all of you for, uh, for coming out um, to uh, discuss uh, this topic, which um, couldn't come at a more uh, propitious time, uh, uh, ten years after the um, uh, Al-Qaeda murdered 3,000 innocent civilians uh, in the United States. Uh, and one of the things that I think um, we probably all recall from that, um, uh, the, the, the days after that attack, was the statement that um, everything changed on 9-11. Uh, everything changed. And I think 10 years later, we can look back and uh, ask, um, to what extent was that hyperbole? To what extent uh, is that true? What has changed and what hasn't changed? And I think uh, in some respects, the answers are uh, surprising. Much, of course, has changed since that time uh, we uh, got involved in two wars. According to the New York Times on Sunday, we've spent $3.3 trillion on those two wars. Uh, according to uh, um, Dennis Blair, who was the director of national intelligence under both uh, President Bush and Obama, we now spend uh, $80 billion a year on counterterrorism measures, $80 billion a year, not counting Iraq and Afghanistan, $80 billion. And he said that generous estimates of the number of Al-Qaeda and their affiliated forces, um, affiliated groups, terrorists around the world, generous estimates put them at between three and 5,000. Uh, so if there's 4,000, so you know, rounded that to, to the middle, 4,000 uh, Al-Qaeda and affiliated group terrorists out there, that means we're spending $20 million per person per year. Um, as Dennis Blair said in, in reporting that, he said, in America, if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. I googled that quote to see you know, where he got it from. It's Mick Jagger. Um, <laughs> uh, ooh, ought to know. Um, uh, and that, you know, when you're talking about that kind of money, uh, what what you what we have created is a uh, a national security industrial complex that rivals the military industrial complex, and means that for the next uh, generation at least, there will always be in the room when initiatives are being discussed a vast amount of government officials and private uh, contractors who are committed to expanding the government's power vis-a-vis -vis security, and very few voices for um, civil liberties uh, and individual rights. So uh, I think in, in that respect, uh, much has changed, and we will live with those changes uh, for uh, the foreseeable future. It's not going away, the national security industrial complex, notwithstanding uh, the killing of Osama bin Laden and of uh, several other of the uh, of Al Qaeda's highest um, officials in, the, in, in, in recent uh, in recent months. But I think one of the most Im important lessons of the last decade is what has not changed. Uh, what has not changed, and, and 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 that is in particular the tenacity of 
um, rule of law values, the tenacity of rule of law values. And so I want to make three points this afternoon and then take your questions. First, that the rule of law turned out to be more resilient in this period than many cynics and realists uh, would have predicted uh, on September 12th, 2001. Second, that with the um, benefit of looking back after 10 years, we can see that the sacrifices in the rule of law, which were made, particularly in the early going, have been shown to be both less necessary and more costly uh, to our security uh, than many uh, thought at the time. And third, I don't know why this keeps doing this, but I'm going to move it down. Uh, third, uh, that the tenacity and resilience of the rule of law is largely a function of civil society, meaning citizens acting together with other citizens through organizations, uh, rather than a function of the separation of powers. It was, I will argue, popular resistance and criticism as much as any institutional interplay of the court, Congress, and the president uh, that managed to re resurrect or reconstruct the rule of law after the damage that was done to it in the early part going. So first, uh, the resiliency, resiliency of the rule of law. What do I mean by claiming that the rule of law is more tenacious than many might have thought? Well, if you think back to uh, September 11th, um, and imagine that someone had said to you on that day, uh, you know, the United States is not going to be able to get away with doing whatever it wants to respond to this attack. Uh, you might well uh, reasonably said, oh yeah? Who's going to stop us? We're the most powerful country in the world. Uh, our military, uh, uh, you know, easily outmuscles the next 25 uh, uh, countries, uh, militaries combined. There is no competing superpower or super authority to constrain us. We were just attacked in one of the most horrific acts that mankind has, has, uh, has uh, ever seen by a group, Al-Qaeda, with few friends around the world. And we know from history that both Congress and the court and the American people will defer to executive power in times of crisis because they always have. Who's going to stop us in doing whatever we f feel is necessary uh, to do? And I think that in some respect that attitude led the Bush administration to treat the rule of law and the constraints that ought to bind us uh, as sort of optional protocols that could be thrust aside in the name of getting the job done, keeping America secure. And so uh, President Bush authorized uh, torture, authorized rendition to torture, authorized the holding of detainees at Guantanamo in secret without any hearings, uh, maintained that they were not entitled to even the minimal protections that the Geneva Conventions provide during wartime to detainees, and subjected them to abusive, cruel, inhuman, and torturous interrogations. We, we opened secret prisons run by the CIA and disappeared suspects into those prisons for years at a time, not even acknowledging that we were holding them. The President unilaterally created military commissions, which could, uh, uh, under the president's rules, execute individuals on the basis of confessions obtained through torture without any judicial review. The president took the position that the Geneva Conventions don't protect uh, al-Qaeda, and that the Convention Against Torture, a human rights treaty that we were instrumental in drafting and have signed and ratified, did not prohibit the use of cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment on foreign nationals held outside of our borders. The president took the, took the position that the executive as commander-in-chief was essentially above the law, that in engaging the enemy, he was not bound by anything Congress or the court said. Uh, so uh, when Congress said it was a crime to engage in torture, the torture memo 
uh, written in President Bush's Justice Department, said that the president, as commander-in-chief, if he decides that torture is necessary in engaging the enemy, he can torture, notwithstanding the fact that Congress made it a crime. Same argument made for the NSA warrantless wiretapping program, which authorized massive wiretapping of um, foreign nationals and citizens, uh, a crime under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, but the executive argued that the president, in engaging the enemy, can engage in this conduct, uh, notwithstanding the fact that Congress uh, made it a crime. Uh, and, of course, relentless exploitation of double standards. That is, many of these uh, initiatives justified on the ground that we were doing it to foreign nationals, not to Americans, and therefore it was okay. <coughs> okay to inflict cruel and human integrating treatment because they're foreigners, not Americans. Okay to try them in military commissions where tortured evidence can be admitted, admitted because we uh, uh, reserve military commission to foreigners, uh, not to citizens. Okay to hold people at Guantanamo in secret because uh, it's limited to foreign nationals, not citizens. So that's, um, you know, I think that's uh, familiar, uh, depressing, but familiar. But I think one of the things that's remarkable when we look back on it is that Bush was actually forced to retreat on virtually all of these initiatives. So once the torture memo, for example, was leaked and the Washington Post published it, the administration immediately retracted it. They couldn't defend in public what they had done in secret. Rendition to torture, where we sent, we abducted people and then delivered them to countries that we knew engaged in torture so that they could torture them for us, largely halted after European uh, uh, nations uh, uh, strongly and repeatedly condemned the practice. Um, Guantanamo uh, detainees initially denied any hearings and held in secret um, the, the, before the Supreme Court issued any decision, uh, the government started giving the Guantanamo detainees hearings uh, and, and uh, made public who was being uh, held there. The, the Bush administration released over 500 of the detainees at Guantanamo, notwithstanding that not a single one was released by order of a court. Uh, and, of course, the Supreme Court uh, rejected a number of these positions. It held that the detainees did have a right to their day in court, that the military commissions uh, that President Bush had created were illegal, that the, that the Geneva Conventions did apply to the detainees, and Congress even got into the act and overruled the um, administration's position, also adopted initially in secret, that the cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment pro protection uh, did not apply to foreign nationals. Congress, uh, under the leadership of Senator McCain, uh, enacted a bill that said that prohibition, which after all is a human rights treaty prohibition, applies to humans, uh, not just to Americans. Then Obama came into office and uh, brought us further within the frame of the rule of law. He closed the CIA's black sites. He ended uh, the practice of torture. He promised to close Guantanamo within a year, has not succeeded, but that's largely because of congressional opposition. He released the previously secret torture memos uh, with, uh, as he said, precisely so that this could never happen again. Uh, he refused to rely on this theory of inherent executive power as commander-in-chief to uh, ignore the law and instead insisted that his authority was constrained by Congress, the Constitution, and international law. And even when the D.C. Circuit in one of the Guantanamo cases recently ruled that in fact international law and the laws of war do not bind the president, the president took the remarkable step of going back to the court and saying, you got it wrong, you gave me too much power, international law does bind my actions. And the court on banc vacated uh, that part of the decision which had previously said that the president was not bound by the laws of, uh, of war. He has released another 100 uh, Guantanamo detainees, uh, again, notwithstanding the fact that none of them have been, have been released pursuant to a court order that they must uh, be released. And he has taken the position that while it's appropriate to use both military as well as criminal uh, law 
to respond to the threat of terrorism, we must do so within the frame of the rule of law, within the values that define us as a nation, uh, not uh, 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 in uh, disregard of those rights and values. Uh, and he made that uh, most explicitly in a speech that he gave uh, on national security at the National Archives in uh, May of 2009. Now, the Obama administration is far from perfect. Uh, it has continued to rely on secrecy both to oppose uh, lawsuits for unconstitutional action uh, on the part of the government uh, and uh, to veil its drone policy in which it uh, has uh, uh, engaged in the targeted killing of many people around the world uh, in, uh, in, a, in, a, in secrecy, so we don't even know the contours of that policy. It has uh, advanced a very expansive interpretation of the law prohibiting material support to designated terrorist groups, taking the position uh, last year in the Supreme Court that law makes it a crime to file an amicus brief in the Supreme Court if it's filed on behalf of a group that we have labeled a uh, terrorist organization, took the position that there should be no judicial review of detention of, uh, of detainees for, for uh, indefinite detention of detainees at Bagram. And uh, most, I think, in, in some ways most troubling, refuses to pursue any form of accountability for the wrongs that were committed in the past. If, if the rule of law doesn't mean very much if uh, if we uh, have people who openly violate it uh, and then when they step down from office write memoirs and brag about the fact that they openly violated it and we take no action uh, to, uh, to hold them account, to account. So, but what we see from this is that Bush II uh, was a much more law-bound regime than Bush I and that Obama's uh, regime has been more law-bound uh, than both Bush II and Bush I. The rule of law, it turns out, was reconstructed, resurrected in substantial part, not entirely, but significantly in this period. All right, the second point I want to make is that we, that we, can, we can see now that we're no less safe uh, as a result of the resurrection of the rule of law and that the sacrifices we made in those values were indeed quite costly. There's no evidence that we are less secure as a nation uh, as a result of being bound by the rule of law that governs war and governs peace. No indication that we were less secure under Bush II than we were under Bush I. No evidence that we were less secure under Obama uh, than under uh, Bush I or Bush II. Um, in fact, we uh, uh, captured and killed uh, Osama bin Laden under Obama, the, mo the, mo the most uh, law-abiding regime, uh, not under uh, President, uh, uh, President Bush. Um, moreover, there's never been any evidence advanced that the lawless tactics, which we employed rather reflexively right after 9-11, were necessary. So, for example, the CIA's own Inspector General looked at the use of torture in the CIA's black sites, what they called enhanced interrogation tactics, and they found, contrary to President, Vice President Cheney's um, uh, unsubstantiated assertions on television, that in fact there is no evidence that information obtained through the use of these um, enhanced interrogation tactics uh, ga gathered evidence that uh, was not or could not have been obtained through the use of lawful, normal uh, interrogation tactics. They also found in that same report that there were no imminent plots disrupted, no ticking time bombs uh, in this entire, uh, the entire course of the six-year period in which the CIA was using enhanced interrogation tactics, often justified, at least in the public debate, on the theory of this um, hypothetical ticking time bomb. Um, uh, experienced interrogators, including uh, most recently Ali Soufan, who was one of the country's leading uh, counterterrorism uh, interrogators, and Matthew Alexander have both written books in which they um, argue that uh, we have uh, consistently obtained more information through using lawful tactics of interrogation, developing rapport and the like with, uh, with our um, adversaries than through uh, the kind of shortcuts of of using uh, co uh, coercion. Um, 
Are there evidence that these tactics didn't work? Well, in the first two years after 9-11, here in the United States, the Bush administration locked up over 5,000 foreign nationals uh, under anti-terrorism initiatives. The theory was some of them might be a terrorist. They all were Arab or Muslim. None of them turned out to be terrorists. The government's record was zero for 5,000. It also called in 8,000 young men for FBI interviews um, on the theory some of them might be terrorists. Um, query whether a terrorist would come in to an uh, FBI, you know, because they got invited to an FBI interview. But um, uh, those 8,000, how were they selected? They, came, they were young men from Arab and Muslim countries. Um, none turned out to be terrorists, zero for 8,000. They then uh, decided to require um, all uh, Arab and Muslim, uh, um, basically all immigrants from Arab and Muslim uh, countries uh, to come in and register, uh, be fingerprinted, photographed, and interviewed by the Immigration Service, again on the theory that we might find a terrorist. 83,000 brought in, no terrorists found. So in this, what I think is the most extensive campaign of ethnic uh, profiling that we've seen since uh, World War II in the Japanese internment, the government's record was zero for 95,000. Uh, that doesn't, there's no evidence that, that makes us safer. Uh, there's plenty of evidence that these measures, these lawless measures, were extremely costly. One is the fact that here it is, more than 10 years after 9-11, we still haven't brought to justice anyone who was behind the 9-11 attacks. It's not because we don't have people in, in detention who were responsible for and behind the 9-11 attacks. Um, it's because the way we treated them when we captured them, by disappearing them, putting them into CIA secret prisons, waterboarding them, them and the like, makes it extremely difficult to then bring them to justice in any kind of fair judicial proceeding because so much of the evidence is tainted by the practices that we employ. We also squandered the world's sympathy. On 9-11, we had the world's sympathy. Le Mans headline on 9-11 was, we are all Americans today. Uh, you haven't seen that headline uh, in Le Mans or any other country's uh, newspaper <coughs> since, and it's largely because we squandered that sympathy through the kind of lawless responses so that um, you know, with, within a few years, Polls were registering higher levels of anti-Americanism around the world than ever before had been uh, been registered um, in, uh, in, uh, in the time that we've been taking polls on that subject. Um, so much so that I, I was in I was living in uh, in London uh, three years ago, and they took a poll on who's the most dangerous person in the world, uh, and Osama bin Laden was number one, but George Bush was number two. And this is our closest ally in the world. Um, that's not good for our national security uh, as we go forward. We essentially gave Al-Qaeda the best propaganda that it could have hoped for. Uh, you know, if, they had, if they had gotten all the best minds in Madison Avenue together and said, come up with a, a slogan or an image that will really allow us to get people pissed off at America supportive of us, sympathetic to us, they couldn't have come up with better images than Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo, uh, and we gave it to them. So the third um, point I want to uh, uh, make is what, what caused this, what, to, where, to what can we attribute this resurrection partial, uh, albeit partial, of the rule of law? Uh, in ordinary times, in ordinary times, we rely on the separation of powers to maintain uh, the rule of law. We, we, we divide power between Congress, the president, and the courts with the notion that they, the courts and Congress will check presidential uh, uh, power. And, you know, that works reasonably well in ordinary times. It tends not to work very well in times of crisis. So in World War I, Congress made it a crime to speak out against the war. The president uh, prosecuted hundreds of people for doing uh, no more than that, and the Supreme Court affirmed their convictions. In World War II, uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt interned 120,000 Japanese, Japanese uh, people of Japanese descent, 70,000 of them American citizens, um, uh, based on their race, and the Supreme Court said uh, that it was perfectly lawful uh, to do that. In the McCarthy era, Congress made it a crime to 
uh, essentially hold communist sympathies, to advocate uh, communist ideas, to be a member of the Communist Party. And the Supreme Court allowed um, hundreds of prosecutions to go forward, did not step in until uh, McCarthyism was on the wane and the Communist Party had essentially been, uh, uh, been destroyed. This time, too, Congress mostly deferred uh, to the President, passed the Patriot Act in, in short order, responded to Supreme Court decisions by overturning them when the Supreme Court said the, Guant the Guantanamo detainees had a right to come into court under the statute, statute of habeas corpus. Congress turned around and said, no, they don't, and, re and repealed that, uh, uh, that, um, uh, that right or, or attempted to do so. Uh, when the Supreme Court said that the military commissions passed, by, uh, enacted by, um, by President Bush uh, unilaterally were illegal, Congress uh, in short order came, uh, came forward and enacted uh, laws that, uh, uh, that authorized military commissions to go forward again using short-circuited procedures for, uh, uh, for foreign nationals. So Congress didn't play much of a role with the exception of the uh, McCain-led uh, uh, amendment on uh, cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment that I referred to earlier. This time, however, the Supreme Court was much less deferential than in prior crises. Uh, it rejected, uh, surprisingly, given its history, rejected several of Bush's key contentions that there's no judicial review at Guantanamo, that there are no Geneva Convention protections for detainees, uh, that the uh, um, ex executive has independent power to create uh, military commissions, contrary to Congress, uh, that uh, you, even U.S. citizens held as enemy combatants are not entitled to a hearing on whether they are, in fact, the enemy or not. Uh, those are, so those are significant decisions, and they played a significant role, I think, in the resurrection of the rule of law. But at the same time, it's important to recognize, and Marcus uh, made this point in an article that he's written, that the decisions were, in fact, quite limited uh, in many respects. Uh, the, the decision in Razul and Boumediene, the first and the fourth cases that the court heard, were only about whether the detainees at Guantanamo have a right to come into federal court at all, just about whether they get in the door, not about whether they have any rights or what those rights might be once they get in the, court, in the door. And there have been a number of uh, subsequent uh, cases in the district courts that have ordered detainees released, but every time the uh, administration has appealed, it has won in the D.C. Circuit and the Supreme Court has not uh, taken up any further uh, cases, so it hasn't led to any actual um, uh, orders that anyone be released from uh, Guantanamo. Uh, in, uh, in, in, in Hamdan, in which the court held the president's military commissions illegal, it did so only on statutory grounds, made clear that Congress could come in and basically fix everything up by passing a statute, and Congress promptly did so. And in Hamdi, the case involving the detention of a U.S. citizen, uh, they did, on the one hand, say that citizens uh, were entitled to uh, due process uh, uh, before they were held as an enemy combatant, but it was very vague about what the particulars of that process were, and the United States uh, avoided any further details on that question by uh, releasing uh, Mr. Hamdi without providing him with any, uh, any hearing. Uh, moreover, most of the retreats that I've talked about were not compelled by any court order or any congressional action. Ending torture, no court order, no congressional action. Halting renditions to torture, no uh, court order or congressional action. Closing the black sites, again, no court order, no congressional action. Halting NSA surveillance, which was halted uh, after it was um, um, uh, leaked by the New York Times. Um, Again, not by virtue of any court order or congressional action. Providing hearings at Guantanamo, again, not by virtue of any con court order or congressional action. Releasing now 600 people uh, of the 775 who've been held at Guantanamo, again, not by virtue of anything Congress or the court said. Um, and abandoning the uh, Article II uh, inherent executive power argument, um, not uh, because either Congress or the court um, uh, squarely uh, rejected it. So what caused the, the retreats? It wasn't like the Bush administration voluntarily retreated on these, uh, on these matters. Um, and I think that you know, while the court decisions played some role, uh, as shown, as I've suggested above, it's much more limited than uh, we sometimes acknowledge. And that, in fact, what caused these changes were 
was civil society. By civil society, I mean individuals organized through nonprofit organizations, speaking out, issuing reports, organizing demonstrations, filing lawsuits, challenging these abuses of power as inconsistent with the values that they uh, see as central to uh, the United States and to uh, uh, human dignity. Uh, groups like uh, the uh, ACLU, the Center for Constitutional Rights, the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, uh, the um, Council on American-Islamic uh, Relations, the, uh, the uh, Human Rights Watch, etc. It's also part of this civil society playing a critical role is the media, uh, which was responsible for the release of um, many of the, the disclosure of many of the secret illegal policies that had been adopted. With them, government employees who, uh, risking prosecution, uh, became whistleblowers and leaked uh, evidence of the illegal uh, 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 programs to the media, which then um, uh, 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 published it. And it wasn't just civil society and, and individuals here, but also abroad. Many foreign officials in Europe and elsewhere were very outspoken about the wrongs that were being done. Lord Stein, um, perhaps most famously, a former, uh, essentially, Supreme Court justice in, in London, in, in England, uh, made a speech in which he referred to Guantanamo as a legal black hole. He's the one who gave it that uh, uh, moniker. 175 members of, of the UK Parliament filed an amicus brief in the first Guantanamo case. The European Parliament was very outspoken on issues of rendition uh, uh, and the like. And it wasn't just the work of civil society since 9-11 either, but also before. So uh, I think one of the, one of the key um, factors in the Supreme Court this time around not deferring, not deferring to the uh, president in a, in a time of national security was that it had Korematsu at the back of its head when it was deciding the, the Guantanamo cases. Korematsu being the case in World War II where the court uh, deferred to President Roosevelt's detention of the, uh, of, the, of the Japanese and Japanese Americans. And why was Korematsu something that they wanted to avoid? It's, a, it's after all, it's a Supreme Court precedent that has never been overruled. Um, what has made Korematsu an anti-precedent was the persistent effort of citizens uh, through organizations, uh, particularly the uh, Asian American and Japanese American uh, uh, organizations and lawyers who did not let that issue lie after the Supreme Court said it was legal, but fought to, 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 to essentially overturn that and eventually did, not in the court, but in Congress, when President Reagan, 40 years later, signed the Civil Liberties Restoration Act and formally apologized to the Japanese and paid reparations. And that kind of long-term accountability through the efforts of civil society has rendered Korematsu a decision that we are, and properly so, ashamed of. And we therefore, the court therefore, I think, learns the lesson of unwarranted deference. Um, now, uh, there are, um, I think alternative accounts to the account that I've told, which in some ways is, you know, some might criticize as too uh, optimistic. Some have said uh, actually Obama has just institutionalized uh, Bush's approaches, that we have normalized uh, the exception, uh, that, um, that we're continuing to engage in a lawless enterprise. I think that's wrong. I think it fails to see the difference between a commitment to act within the rule of law while using military as well as criminal tools to respond, and a full-scale effort to just bypass law altogether. I think that's a very fundamental difference. I think the criticism that Obama has simply just continued the Bush policies is also unrealistic about, about how we might be responding. I think it, 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 it's predicated on the notion that military force is, is somehow not appropriate at all in responding to an attack like that which we faced on 9-11. So, for example, the, the, the phrase, try or release, that we shouldn't be holding anyone at Guantanamo unless we try them criminally, that ignores the fact that if 
Um, we are in an armed conflict in Afghanistan um, with uh, uh, the Taliban and Al Qaeda. It is perfectly appropriate in an armed conflict in an armed, to hold the enemy. If you can't hold the enemy, uh, how else can you incapacitate them? Uh, only by killing them. Uh, and so if you're going to be in an armed conflict, there is a role for preventive detention. It has to be done within the framework of the laws of war. You have to give people hearings when there's doubt. You have to ensure that people are treated humanely. That's what the international law and the laws of war require. But you don't have to try them uh, or uh, uh, release them. Uh, so if war is a legitimate response, and the, the world seemed to think so, NATO and the UN both treated the, the attacks on 9-11 as giving rise to the right of self-defense. Over 130 nations signed on to our uh, incursion into Afghanistan. Uh, then, uh, then it follows that certain measures that are appropriate in wartime, not in peacetime, are going to be um, uh, going to be appropriate as long as they're done within the, uh, the rule. Um, others might suggest, well, the pendulum, you know, always swings back and forth, and we always overreact in times of crisis, and then we um, come around. So this is nothing new. But I think that view risks complacency. The pendulum doesn't swing of its own accord. Uh, the pendulum swings if it swings because people have spoken out and, and, and put pressure on the pendulum to move back uh, in the other uh, direction. Um, I, I think that's especially so given the power of the national security industrial complex and the fear um, that the attacks on 9-11 um, uh, raised. Um, so there are um, many uh, challenges that remain ahead um, uh, secrecy, the material support statute, uh, the, the use of immigration uh, as a kind of pretextual uh, 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 tool to target uh, suspects without probable cause uh, and, and, and the like, the failure to hold uh, any form of accountability mechanism. I think an independent commission it would be the best uh, to look back at the wrongs that we have committed in the past. Um, there are many uh, struggles ahead, but that, to me, only underscores the importance of uh, citizens, us, you, um, keeping, maintaining vigilance, uh, keeping engaged, uh, working with the kinds of organizations that have spoken out for the uh, values that reflect America at its best, uh, rather than uh, the facts that uh, reflect America uh, at its worst. I think this also suggests, if I'm right, that it's civil society and, 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 and people speaking out that, that, that w is critically responsible for the resurrection of the rule of law, it underscores the critical importance of the First Amendment uh, as a guarantee of the political freedom to speak out, to organize, to criticize, to Dissent. Vincent Blasey, uh, a First Amendment scholar at Columbia, uh, famously wrote an article um, probably two decades ago uh, called The Checking Function of the First Amendment, in which he said the First Amendment, you know, people talk about the First Amendment is about being, about the search for truth, about the marketplace of ideas, about self-government, about self-actualization. You know, but what the First Amendment is about, really, is the it's a check. It's another check on the abuse of power. And I think um, uh, that uh, has certainly been the case um, since 9-11. As Learned Hand uh, once wrote, liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. When it dies there, no constitution, no law, no court can even do much to help it. While it lies there, it needs no constitution, no law, no court to save it. Now, like all great quotes, this overstates the case. Uh, I think the Constitution and the courts play a critical role. Uh, they remind us of the values that we do um, uh, hold highest uh, in, 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 when we consider our nation uh, at its best. Court cases in particular can be focal points for organization, uh, but I think it's absolutely critical that in the absence of the kind of, uh, of uh, outspoken, 
political activism and criticism, uh, the learned hand is right that the courts and Congress cannot save us. So I'll close with another great quote, uh, this one from Cornell West and Roberto Unger. Uh, this is from a book they, call, they wrote called, together called The Future of American Progressivism. It's a very, very thin book, unfortunately, but um, it does have this great quote, and it's a quote about what makes people fight for justice. And they write, hope is more the consequence of action than its cause. As the experience of the spectator favors fatalism, so the experience of the agent produces hope. And what I think they mean by that is that people don't get engaged because they have hope, but rather it works the other way around. They develop hope through engagement. The future of our Constitution and our liberties, I believe, depends on that engagement by all of us and that hope. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take uh, questions or challenges or, um, yeah. How do you think history might have been different in the last 10 years had uh, the attack, 9-11 attack, been treated as a criminal action rather than an act of war? I thought you were going to say, um, had the Supreme Court uh, decided the election for uh, Al Gore. <laughs> 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 Um, well, you know, that is the um, that is the, 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 the most common the most common criticism when you go to Europe um, uh, about the United States response to this entire attack is that we made a tactical mistake, even if it was legal to launch war against Afghanistan, it was a tactical mistake because by um, engaging in war, you kind of elevate the terrorists from criminals, which is what they are, to warriors, right? They want to be seen as warriors, not criminals. Um, and, uh, and I think there's, there's truth to that, and uh, I think it's a, there are definitely costs to responding to a terrorist attack with military uh, force, and I think we've seen some of those um, costs. Uh, at the same time, I, I don't really think it was much of an option. Uh, right after 9-11. I mean, we had in the, you know, a sustained a number of attacks up until 9-11, including the first World Trade Center bombing, including the coal, including the embassies uh, in Africa, um, in which Al-Qaeda had, um, uh, had taken American lives, and Al-Qaeda had declared war against us, and we responded to all of those in a criminal law enforcement uh, model, and, you know, 9-11 um, uh, suggested that it wasn't quite working. So, um, you know, and I think once the Taliban refused to turn over the, the um, uh, Al Qaeda leadership, which was responsible for the attacks, uh, it was it was um, certainly lawful and probably appropriate to respond. I also think that if you ask why there hasn't been another attack uh, in 10 years, it's not because Al Qaeda didn't want there to be another attack in 10 years. Uh, in many people, this is one of the most surprising facts for many people um, who were sure that there'd be other, there'd be more attacks. I think, uh, you know, I don't think it's by, because we tortured uh, people. I don't think it's because we disappeared people. I do think um, that we, by using military force in Afghanistan, did um, greatly weaken Al Qaeda, um, and we have continued through military force to greatly weaken Al Qaeda, so that um, most of its leadership is now out of commission. Uh, and it is a much, much weaker force than it was. And that's through military force. So, um, uh, so I think, you know, in the absence of military force, we might not have incurred some of the costs that we have uh, incurred in terms of America's standing around the world, but we also might be facing a, uh, a stronger <coughs> Al-Qaeda today. So, and, you know, I, it's very hard to know. But I'm not one who says you can only respond through the criminal model. I think it's, you should try to respond through the criminal model. Generally, it's better to respond through the criminal model, but then when, you, when an attack is of the magnitude of 9-11 uh, and comes from an organization which has openly declared war against us, I think it's appropriate 
to and, and there's not a, a lawful way to bring them to uh, justice because they're being harbored by a country that will uh, with, will ignore our requests. Uh, I think it's appropriate in that situation to respond militarily. I think you know Iraq was a, a, a tremendous mistake, and of course Afghanistan has proven, as was for the Soviets, much more complicated than we ever thought. Um, but uh, um, that's that's as much as I can say. Well, as the, as the director of the Iowa affiliate of the ACLU, I really like your speech because <laughs> you basically yeah. promoted uh, yeah, well, more, so more you power to you. You certainly tour all the, all the affiliates uh, with that. I know you've done a lot of great work. Um, I wanted to ask you, based on your premise, the next time something like this were to happen, do you think the last 10 years would alter the reaction of the policymakers in the, yeah. In yeah. the next time? Yeah. Well, you know, that's certainly my hope, right? And I think that is, um, that's a great question. What's going to happen after the next attack, right? And we've been, so people have been uh, uh, asking that for, uh, since the first attack. Uh, you think this is bad, what happens after the next attack, right? Um, uh, and I think it depends. You know, I don't think it's necessarily the case that there's a ratcheting down, you know, in which we sort of just get more and more, um, um, uh, brutal in our responses and more and more repressive in uh -huh. our uh, measures. And I, you know, I think one example that, that you can learn from your mistakes, and one example that I would point to for that is the UK, uh, which responded to the um, uh, troubles, uh, as they called them, with the IRA initially in much the same way that we responded uh, to 9-11. Uh, they responded militarily, uh, they detained lots of people without charges, and they used torture to interrogate them. Uh, but uh, within a relatively short period thereafter, they halted those measures, and they appointed a uh, commission headed up by a former, um, uh, again, Supreme Court Justice Law Lord, they call them there, uh, Lord Parker, who wrote a report, uh, a, a very you know, full report on what had happened, uh, and concluded that it was uh, not just wrong, but illegal. And that, uh, and I think the UK learned from that. And so they, um, you know, the debate in the UK today is a much more reasoned one. And their response to the terrorist attacks they suffered is much was much less extreme than our response. So again, again there's, there are many measures they've taken since, since their 7-7, um, the, the, the subway and bus bombings, uh, that raised civil liberties concerns, to be sure, uh, but it was on a very, uh, very different scale. And torture, for example, is there's a wide consensus in the UK that torture is just not acceptable. Whereas here, by contrast, um, it's it's an open question whether torture is acceptable. And in fact, polls suggest that m a greater number of Americans today believe that torture is justifiable. Uh, than did in the first couple of years after 9-11. So, and I think that's in part because we have not been willing to look back. We're not very good at admitting that we've made mistakes. It wasn't just, it isn't just President Bush who doesn't like to admit that he ever made a mistake. It's us as Americans. We don't like to admit that we've made uh, mistakes. And so uh, we haven't had any kind of accountability for the wrongs that were uh, committed, and I think that's a real mistake because the way you the way you learn from from history is through uh, accountability mechanisms. I don't believe that uh, we should see a you know prosecution in the United States versus Bush, Cheney, John Yoo, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, uh, but I do believe that there are other forms of accountability, and this uh, commission uh, approach that the UK took, that this that the Canadians took when. Um, uh, they were involved in the rendition of, a, of one of their citizens, Mahar Arar, to Syria. We did the renditioning, but they provided some of the information that led to it. Uh, when he was brought back uh, to Canada, they did a full investigation, wrote an 1,100-page report, uh, formally apologized to Mr. Arar, paid him $10 million in damages. Um, that's a form of accountability. Nobody went to jail, but that's a form of accountability. By contrast, here in the United States, we have refused to apologize to Mr. Arar. We, I, I represented him here in the United States, uh, and the government has argued that you can't even um, bring a lawsuit, successfully argued, I should say, the government, uh, you can't even bring a lawsuit um, seeking to hold accountable those who sent him to Syria to be tortured. 
Um, you don't learn from your mistakes if you're not willing to have some, some form of accountability. Yeah. Um, I have two questions in terms of the Obama uh, Obama and the rule of law. And one deals with the assassinations done by drones and whether that's when you're whether that's within the rule of law and yeah. the approach to it. Yeah. And the second is on the whistleblowers and the treatment of Bradley Manning and WikiLeaks. If you could address both of those. Well, the drones situation I think is um, complicated. Um, my my, the, my principal objection to the drone is the fact that we don't even know what the drone policy is. We don't know what the criteria are as to who gets targeted or the procedures by which uh, we ensure that we're not targeting the wrong people. I don't think um, killing is wrong, don't stop the tape there, in wartime, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, in, it, it, when you're in a war, you kill the other side. That's part of what you do. That's sort of, you know, uh, unfortunately, that's uh, uh, a necessary part of war. And so, um, you know, whether you're shooting somebody with a rifle or with a drone, if it's in war and he's on the other side and he's trying to kill you, um, it's legal. Uh, if it's if it's done if it's outside of wartime, uh, and we're just killing people, um, you know, far from the battlefield, no connection to. You know, we decide, well, there's somebody in Iowa who we really don't like, and so we send a drone to kill them in their backyard. Even if there's no collateral damage, that's illegal, right? Um, so, uh, you know, but the, and, and what we know is that many of the drones have been used in Afghanistan and Pakistan and that border area where a lot of the Al-Qaeda and Taliban people have sort of, you know, retreated to, uh, but are continuing to engage in the fight. Um, but they've also been used in Yemen and, 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 and other places fairly far from the field. And, and my, my, my view is on this is we should at least know what the policy is. If our government is in the business of putting people on the list to be killed, including American citizens, there's an American citizen on the list, uh, we should know what's the, what are the criteria, what are the procedures to ensure that we don't make mistakes, and then we can judge whether it's legal or not. And right now, we can't judge whether it's legal or not because we don't, uh, we don't even, we're not even told that. And I think you could be told that, the, the general contours, without forfeiting the secrecy that's obviously necessary uh, with respect to you know, when, when someone's going to be targeted or who has been targeted. And, and uh, with respect to whistleblowers, I find it disturbing that the Obama administration, one of the, one of the things that's disturbing and disappointing about the administration is its um, apparent um, ramping up of prosecutions against whistleblowers, more prosecutions against whistleblowers um, apparently than, uh, than um, many prior administrations uh, and uh, in some really uh, troubling cases that don't seem to stand up, like the Tom, Thomas Drake case, which um, recently fell apart, um, uh, in which he uh, disclosed information about uh, the NSA, which was, um, uh, which showed uh, Corruption, insider dealing, and, and, and the like. So um, that I think is 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 very problematic. There's clearly a role for secrecy, but there's also a role for whistleblowing, uh, and and uh, the the emphasis has been I think too strong on the secrecy side. Um, with I, I don't think I have time or expertise to to address WikiLeaks and Bradley Manning. So. Take one more. Yeah. Uh, let me let me get somebody new because there are other people who have. Yeah. Well, then I'll take both of you and then I'll try to answer both questions. So why don't you go first and then. For me? Yeah. So then if it was all right for us to go in and assassinate bin Laden because it's war, then it would be okay for them to come back and assassinate Obama? Yeah. If it's wartime. I mean, they, they don't, you know, this is, this, is, this is a situation in which, you know, all right. Um, uh, uh, yes, you know, we're shooting at them. They're shooting at us. That's what happens in an armed conflict. Now, there's questions about whether they have the, whether they have the right to shoot, right, to kill us. But once we en engage in military conflict against them, yes, they have a right to engage in military conflict against us. And um, so I don't, I don't have a, pro a problem with the killing of Osama bin Laden. I, you know, I, if, as some people have asserted, uh, the order was to kill him regardless of whether he surrenders, that's illegal. But that's not that, that the people have asserted that, but the uh, the the statements have actually been quite to the contrary that it was kill or capture, 
uh, and that if he were willing, if he were in fact you know put up the white flag, we would capture him. But um, I don't. I think you can you can certainly target and kill the person who is heading up the armed force that's fighting against you uh, in wartime. And the fact that it was he was in Pakistan rather than in. Um, uh, in, in Afghanistan may be an issue vis-a-vis -vis sovereignty with respect to Pakistan, but you know that's a um, that's separate from whether it's uh, legal under uh, under the laws of war. And then yeah, yeah. Um, there's been a quite a bit of like public public criticism regarding like a number of intelligence measures that affected you know, privacy of U.S. citizens, um, such as the Patriot Act, the TSA body scans. Yeah. Um, do you think civil society has had effect on um, the of those yeah. Those things, yeah, that's a great question, and and I think a huge one because you know one of the great one of the things that definitely has changed in the last ten years is technological capability, right? So there's a case now in the Supreme Court this term well, I think one of the most important privacy cases that the court has heard in years involving whether the the, the police can stick a GPS monitor on your car and then use it to monitor. Uh, everywhere you go 24-7 for a month without getting a warrant. And the Obama administration has said, yes, we can do that. We don't need a warrant. It's not an invasion of privacy at all to know every place you have gone in your car for a month. Um, and, you know, there, we didn't even have GPS monitors that could do that, you know, 10 years ago. And that, and, and that kind of technological capability is uh, expanding, you know, way faster than we can deal with it through the law and I think poses great risks to the you know to a, to a, a society in which we have the the, the privacy um, to develop criticism and to feel the you know the, the freedom to uh, organize associate affiliate and uh, and engage in critique so I think that this is a, a huge challenge uh, it now and going forward um, you know, people have, you know, ha has civil society had an effect? To some extent, yes. I mean, I don't know how many people remember, but after 9-11, one of the proposals was to create the, um, uh, I'm going to blank on the name of it now, but because it had such a great name, I, I, I wish I could remember it. But maybe someone can. It's the John Poindexter program in the Pentagon. To total information awareness, right? Total information awareness. This was a program in putting up, the Pentagon was putting together in which they would gather all the data that's out there from public databases and private databases and put it into this massive um, data set, which the Pentagon would then monitor for, you know, patterns of terrorist activity, whatever those are. So all of us would be monitored. Uh, on a 24-7 basis with respect to all that data. And, you know, almost everything you do today um, creates data. Most of you probably have a smartphone. Uh, you've all told your smartphone company that you're here listening to me talk today, and the government can get all that information, right? So the proposal was give that all to the, to, the, to the military and let them search it through. We'll call it total information awareness. We'll put in charge of it John Poindexter, who was... Um, uh, uh, who was involved in the Iran-Contra affair, um, and will create a motto for the program, um, which is a pyramid with a huge computer eye on the top of it, and the logo, knowledge is power. I mean, it's like uh, Michel Foucault and George Orwell working together couldn't have come up with a better. You know, and, and what, what happened? People, that, that got disclosed in the New York Times, and people were outraged, my privacy is going to be infringed? No way. And Congress, uh, in short order, passed a law prohibiting any funding for the furtherance of that program. Now, you know, the back story is that then the Pentagon just continued to do it in secret, in, you know, off the books, um, and there continue to be uh, developments along those lines. But, but that was an, in, an instance of people rising up. I think, you know, if you look at the Patriot Act, there hasn't been a lot of successful pushback on the Patriot Act, but where there's been pushback on the Patriot Act, it's been with respect to those provisions that, see, that, that potentially affect sort of ordinary Americans, like the library's provision. That's not the worst provision in the Patriot Act. The worst provision in the Patriot Act are the ones that are targeted at foreign nationals, render people deportable for being affiliated with a group 
of two or more people that have ever engaged in any act of violence or even being the spouse or child of someone who's affiliated with one of those groups. I mean, that's, that's very, very um, uh, e extreme, but very little objection there for nationals. Uh, where it's us, more, um, uh, more objections. And historically, um, Congress has actually been pretty good about protecting our privacy, better than the court, about protecting our privacy, uh, in part because I think we all have an interest in maintaining our privacy. So when the Supreme Court said, you have no Fourth Amendment right to your um, bank records, and that means the government can get your bank records without a warrant, without probable cause, Congress came along and said, no, they can't and passed a law that protected those, um, those records and said as a statutory matter, you do have to get, the government does have to make some showing of probable cause and the like before you. So um, I think it's the kind of issue on which um, organized um, uh, you know, activism you know, led by groups like the ACLU can make a difference and is going to be critical uh, going forward because there are a lot of threats on the other side. Well, Professor Poole has a plane to catch, but on behalf of Drake Law School, I want to thank you so much.